right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kim Lewis, and I am the legislative advocate for Scenic. We wanna thank you for joining us this morning for an overview of Scenic, or the Corporation for Education Network Initiatives in California, which also operates the California Research and Education Network, known as CalREN. As we are starting our second year of this pandemic, I don't think I need to underscore the importance of broadband. We all know it. We do hope that today's webinar will leave you with a strong understanding of the role that research and education networks play in the telecommunications ecosystem, as well as the benefits that Scenic brings to California. For today's presentation, please note that we will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A throughout, and we hope that we will leave some time at the end to be able to answer any questions. Today, you'll be hearing from um, illustrious staff at Scenic, and first and foremost, starting with our president and CEO, Louis Fox, who's been a champion and advocate for access and equity since the start of the internet. Louis? Thank you, Kim. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we are uh, really entering a, a historic moment. Um, uh, with uh, an incredible array of, uh, of legislation, both at the state and the federal levels, um, to support uh, broadband. And we thought it was important that we talk um, with all of you a bit about Scenic, uh, about what we currently do, and about uh, ways that we might serve the state uh, in the future. Um, First of all, we are a uh, not-for-profit uh, public benefit corporation, and we were <clears throat> founded uh, initially by our, our research university members, uh, joined by the Cal State University. And then subsequently, uh, we have uh, brought on community colleges, uh, public K-12 schools, um, uh, and uh, public libraries, uh, in addition to uh, our university medical centers, uh, and uh, increasingly a vast number of, uh, of healthcare institutions, along with uh, other scientific and uh, cultural organizations. The mission of Scenic is, is really twofold. Um, when the uh, uh, NSFNet was decommissioned, there were a number of, of regional networks that were around that had been purpose built uh, to serve uh, research. California very early on was one of the first of them to uh, own its own fiber infrastructure. Uh, many of our uh, sister organizations would buy um, lit services from carriers. The advantage here is that we were able to create a tailor-made uh, network for um, our research and education community. Next slide, please. We, um, as I said, our mission is twofold. One is to uh, continue to provide a platform and preposition um, one of the uh, uh, strongest, most talented, most creative research communities uh, on the globe for continued success. The other part of our mission is to make sure that community anchor institutions, regardless of where they are in California, can get access uh, to Scenic's backbone and its services. Our backbone is roughly 8,000 miles of optical fiber. Um, we uh, uh, direct connect via fiber our research universities, many of our um, uh, larger organizations, uh, LA Unified comes to mind here, um, uh, all of the CSUs, the UCs, and so on. Um, but the rest of our members connect to us via, via uh, circuits that we get from uh, every carrier uh, in California. So we have a very close working relationship uh, with the private sector. Uh, roughly 12,000 um, uh, sites in California connect to Scenic. Um, and as you see, we, we, we collaborate with a lot of private sector partners. Um, it's not just carriers, but it's equipment providers and uh, numerous others. And we are uh, about to enter our 25th year of uh, serving California. Next slide, please. Here you'll see just in the light lines, in addition to running this, <clears throat> 
backbone network, which has a lot of services on it. I mean, one of the things that we want to do for you today is to try and distinguish um, what CalREN is and does from what uh, commercial ISPs do, because we're really, we're really quite different from commercial ISPs. But you'll see in the lighter lines, another network that we run, which is called the Western Regional Network. Um, and we do that in partnership with um, um, sister organization, the Pacific Northwest, Pacific Northwest Gigapop, uh, the Front Range Gigapop, which serves uh, Colorado and Wyoming, New Mexico Gigapop, uh, uh, University of Hawaii, uh, and others. And this is to, this is uh, a uh, research infrastructure um, that is critical um, to a lot of research domains uh, in California. Next slide. In addition to the Western Regional Network, we run uh, what's called a national and international peering exchange. This is so that um, our researchers can connect with their peers uh, in, uh, in the Asia Pacific and in Europe that we're showing. Um, they can access uh, uh, you know, massive amounts of data and they can access remote instruments. Many of them are global scale instruments that there may only be one of them uh, extant in the world. An example that most people have heard about is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, but there are telescopes uh, and, uh, and other kinds of instruments, as well as sensor networks, including sensor networks that are um, uh, on the seafloor. Um, this is a, a map. Uh, we have nodes uh, in uh, Los Angeles, Sunnyvale, Seattle, um, on Oahu, in Guam, and in Tokyo. And we're hopeful to bring up a node in the next few years uh, in Fairbanks so that we can um, access all the Arctic nations uh, scientific research, uh, which is critical research um, around uh, in climate science. We also, with Internet2, run, a, if you will, an express lane across the United States that allows the uh, exchanges uh, in the DC area and New York um, to interconnect with the West Coast, uh, as well as the uh, important exchange in Chicago. Eventually this infrastructure we built out, dedicated infrastructure we built out to Miami, where uh, we will be able to uh, uh, similarly um, uh, in an express lane way, uh, access networks in Central South America, the Caribbean, and Africa. Next slide, please. This is just to give you a flavor of the kinds of, of entities that research and education networks connect. And we're gonna talk a bit more about that uh, over the course of the presentation. But um, we have a significant role to play vis-a-vis -vis community anchor institutions. And um, now that we have built out our backbone um, to have nearly infinite capacity. Uh, there's no such thing as infinite capacity, but it certainly has a uh, uh, capacity that uh, is way in advance of uh, any needs that our members uh, currently have or anticipate needing. Uh, and so we are able to potentially um, uh, open it up to more community anchor institutions. Next slide, please. It's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce a couple of the talented staff that uh, <clears throat> Kim mentioned. Raul Wincon is the Vice President of Operations and uh, HR, and Stanley Hahn is the Manager of, our, of Network Operations and who is, in, is charged with running our Network Operations Center, which he'll talk about as well. Thanks, Lewis. Scenic's value is in being a mission and membership-driven organization. We don't operate under the normal service provider customer paradigm. Institutions join us as members and become participants in the organization itself. They make up our board of directors and run our technical advisory committees. They become a part of the scenic community. As Lewis was kind enough to show us, that community then extends to thousands of research and education institutions across the globe. Our staff of engineers use their technical expertise to design and run multiple specialized networks that are tailored to the needs of that community. We develop new services to ensure that they can reach important content, application, and cloud service providers such as Amazon AWS and Google in a much more direct manner than internet service providers. 
Working with such a large swath of California also allows us to focus on lowering costs and offering assistance when it comes to maximizing federal and state subsidies. We understand that navigating this territory can be complex and we're here to help. We also understand that the needs vary among our dynamic and diverse constituents and we're able to be responsive to their individual needs. The value of Scenic is reflected in our own organizational core values. We are made up of individuals who are products of the schools that we serve or for whom the educational system has touched a part of our lives. My grandmother was a teacher, my mother was a teacher and a librarian, my sister was a teacher, my father was a university administrator at many of the schools that we work with today. I'm not alone among seeing employees with these ties and I care deeply about providing the greatest value that we can to our associates. When COVID-19 started moving students, teachers and staff out of schools, our work was just beginning. Our network traffic didn't lessen, but it shifted directions overnight. It moved to residential broadband networks and services such as Zoom and Blackboard. We were working around the clock to scale our network connections to ensure that students remain connected to their teachers and peers. Our network operations center is an important component in all of this. And Stanley Hahn, our manager of network operations will walk us through what makes that group special. Thanks, Raul. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, Raul spoke about the benefits of Scenic to the research and education community. I'm going to take a few minutes to focus on one major benefit, which is Scenic's 24 by 7 NOC, short for Network Operations Center. I have the definition of a network operation center on your screen for those of you that are hearing this term for the first time. So what does this actually mean? Well, for those of you that have had issues with your residential internet connection and needed to call their support center, you've communicated with your provider's NOC. The person you spoke with was most likely from their first tier of support and asked you questions such as, have you rebooted your modem, what color the lights are, and so forth. I'm sure the experience was less than ideal. So how is Scenic's NOC different? Most importantly, we are not tiered. Scenic's NOC, our network operations center, is comprised of 24 time network engineers. The person that picks up the phone is the same person that is going to help you resolve the issue. Whether it's slow speeds or your connection is completely down, our engineers are highly technical and capable of assisting you. We are also proactive. Because we're 24 by seven, we're watching the network even when the world's asleep. If there are network issues that occur overnight, our engineers will detect, and, will detect and resolve the issues before students arrive at school, or most recently before they log into their Zoom sessions from home. 24 by seven network availability has been increasingly important in countless ways from ensuring campus staff has access to cloud services such as Office 365, or being able to connect 600,000 K-12 students simultaneously to, to testing centers. Next slide, please. Here you'll see statistics from 2020, which have grown year over year. With operating a leading edge network, it is necessary for our engineers to be highly technical and adapt well to a dynamic environment. For example, we recently implemented a DDoS mitigation service that many of our UCs and K-12 sites have taken advantage of. We've also connected various medical institutions from university campuses such as the UC health systems to hospitals such as City of Hope. Downtime and outages for these sites are non-negotiable as people's lives are at stake. DDoS and medical institutions are just two examples of the continuous evolution needed in the IT sector. So as a nonprofit, how do we sustain a level of technical excellence? The most important component is finding the right people. We have a vigorous interview process to find engineers that align with our mission and have, have a strong work culture fit. We place a strong emphasis on continuous personal development, and I truly believe that this has played a large role in scenic success. As Raul mentioned earlier, many of our staff have links to the research and education world. I have cousins that are teachers. My mom was a, a healthcare professional and I am a product of the California education system. Our staff is extremely dedicated to operating California's research and education network. Robert Kwan, our director of engineering, will speak more about the network. Thanks, Dan. Similar to Stan and Raul, I'm a product of California's education system. I've attended public K-12s and colleges in California, and I've benefited directly from Scenic. Next slide. Like other carriers, Scenic provides connections to the internet. What is the internet? The internet is a network of networks. It is not run by a single entity. Rather, it is a combination of many autonomous networks connecting together through a collaborative effort. As of March, 2021, 
there are about 100,000 global networks connecting together to create the internet. Scenic is one of these networks and connects the research and education community of California to the world. We accomplished this by cultivating hundreds of connections with other cloud, content distribution, research, and education organizations. Scenic is able to do this due to our deep relationships with members of the internet ecology and our substantial user base. However, Scenic is also different from traditional carriers. We're governed by our members, which creates a collaborative environment where the members determine Scenic's goals. For example, we have a standard internet network and custom networks tailored to the unique needs of research and education. This custom network provides greater flexibility that researchers and education institutions require to do their data intensive research. As Stan had mentioned earlier, through the collaborative environment we have with our members, we're able to listen to their needs. We have deployed a distributed denial of service mitigation service to protect from the threat of attacks across the internet, which have previously taken down Amazon and other major companies. This service has already been used to much success and allowed our members to seamlessly continue operations during these attacks. On the fiscal side, as Raul mentioned, due to Scenic's aggregate buying power in both circuit and equipment, Scenic is able to obtain additional savings, which we pass on to our members. Over the last three years, we've been engaged on the path towards next generation infrastructure, an effort to modernize the network. With this effort, Scenic's network will be even more flexible than today. What's coming next? The capability for our members to address their unique needs to extend their network privately and seamlessly across Scenic's network. This will provide cost savings and ease of members network management. Connections to major cloud providers and connections to Epic and an electronic medical record platform which will contribute to better healthcare delivery. 400 gigabit connections, which is 1250 times California's average statewide speed of 40 megabytes per second. Next slide. What is leading edge networking? Leading edge networking is, is a flexible and extensible network that is able to meet the, the members' needs. Coming up next on the next couple of slides, we'll show what that means. Next slide. Scenic's network enables many exciting and critical research from climate to particle physics. A project that Scenic has directly contributed to and has had much success is a Pacific Research Platform. Pacific Research Platform is a data sharing architecture that has enhanced the ability for researchers in California, nationwide, and internationally to share data and run simulations for projects like genomic research, extreme weather research, brain research, and underwater archeological research. Among Pacific Research Platform's many participants, it includes California institutions such as the, University of Cal the Universities of California, San Diego State University, Caltech, USC, and Stanford. Institutions across the nation, such as University of Hawaii, University of Washington, and Northwestern. International institutions, such as University of Amsterdam. Federal research facilities with the Department of Energy, and four national supercomputers. Most recently, during the pandemic, Pacific Research Platform was used as part of Holding at Home to identify coronavirus proteins critical in understanding COVID-19. Folding at Home is the largest crowdsourced distributed supercomputer that enables anyone to contribute to biomedical research. This has contributed to understanding and developing treatment for Alzheimer's, Huntington's, and cancer, among many others. Next slide. With the, with the pers persistent threat of wildfires in California, a critical project supported by Scenic is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is an infrastructure of remote cameras and sensors connected to servers and is used by many first responders, such as LA County Fire Department and San Diego Fire Department to get real-time information and run simulations to develop reactive and proactive strategies to fire response. Fire map and the video feeds are available to the public and have been accessed over 8 million times during the devastating wildfires of 2017. Additionally, communications to these remote areas is critical during hazardous conditions. First responders are able to leverage the existing Wi-Fi infrastructure supported by the scenic network to communicate in the field. Next slide. NOAA's important work in climate change, weather, and oceans helps us understand the impacts of global climate change. Hundreds of researchers within California's colleges and universities conduct research into these topics. For example, 
NOAA hosts a cooperative institute for marine, earth, and atmospheric systems at the University of California, San Diego, which will advance the regional, national, and global understanding of natural and human-caused impacts on our ecosystem and the sustainable ways to strengthen our environmental and economic well-being. This institute is comprised of a consortium that includes Humboldt State University, Moss Landing Marine Labs, University of California, Davis, and University of California, Los Angeles, among many others. NOAA uses Scenics Network in sharing this valuable data across California's research and education institutions. National entities such as FEMA, NASA and FEMA, many international partners, among them Australia's Commonwealth, the French Research Institute, and the Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science. Next slide. Another resource that is critical to California and beyond is the San Diego Supercomputer Center. It is a leader in data intensive computing used to support a wide variety of domains. Scenic connects the San Diego Supercomputer Center to the world. A couple examples of the connections, a 200 gigabit connection between Caltech and, the San, Diego, and San Diego Supercomputer Center to support particle physics research. University of California, Santa Cruz's Cancer Genomic Hub a secure repository for storing, cataloging, and accessing cancer genome sequences that is housed at San Diego Supercomputer Center and accessed globally. Recently, researchers used San Diego Supercomputer's vast computing power, and in the two months during the pandemic, at least 164 unique individuals ran hundreds of jobs analyzing coronavirus-related DNA sequences. Next slide. Scenic understands the different needs of our community, and among them, the importance of K-12's California assessment of student performance and progress testing. The test is administered to about 600,000 students simultaneously. The large amount of data this generates is transferred across Scenic's network to the testing servers and is treated with the same level of care as research data. To aid in the smooth testing experience, Scenic constantly monitors and upgrades its network but also provides high touch support through highly skilled scenic engineers joining K-12 conference bridges to provide a quicker response to any issues. Next slide. As everyone has experienced, the pandemic has changed how we work, live and work. During a week period, post the stay at home order, scenic noticed significant shifts in the usage of the network. Prior to the stay at home order, the institutions connected to scenic were consuming content from the internet. Post to stay at home order, this has shifted to the institutions becoming content providers. During the post stay at home order, the scenic network saw significant increases in Zoom and virtual private network traffic, which reached one petabit per week. This amounts to 40,000 Blu-ray discs. Even more so, with everyone connecting from home, we saw a large increase of 323% in residential internet traffic to carriers such as Spectrum, AT&T, Verizon, and Comcast from Scenic. Scenic's approach of bringing new technologies to our members, staying ahead of network capacity needs, having robust connections to commercial entities such as Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Zoom, and residential internet providers such as Spectrum, AT&T, Verizon, and Comcast ensured that our members had ample capacity and connectivity even during these large shifts in usage. Now I'll be handing it back over to Lewis to talk about access and equity efforts. Thank you, Robert. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, beyond uh, the day-to-day -day projects that uh, we've been describing, um, how are we sort of broadening the base and thinking about other needs um, of uh, our constituents and Californians? Um, and there are several different ways that we're doing this. Uh, next slide, please. First is core program initiatives. Um, we have been working with our K-12 colleagues over the past six years uh, to provision uh, gigabit connectivity to uh, schools that were that have either had little or that that have had little or no service to date. Um, and to date, that program has uh, uh, served 430 schools. There's a second project that we've been working on, and. Uh, this is to come up with some uh, more creative solutions where we might look beyond the school to partner with a local library uh, or other entities 
to ensure that, that not just the school, but the community uh, may have uh, more robust uh, internet. Next slide, please. Um, uh, we have, uh, for about the last seven years, been working to connect all of California's public libraries at gigabit speeds. Um, and we have 829 connected. Uh, by the time we get to the end of the next uh, fiscal year, we'll be close to 1,000 uh, of the 1,150 uh, public libraries in California uh, that will be connected uh, to our backbone. Uh, most from one to 10 gigabits. Uh, we have also the world's first 100 gig li uh, library, which is uh, LA Public. Next slide. Um, one of the issues that we've all, you've all heard about and, uh, and has been a concern, uh, particularly uh, exacerbated by, by COVID, has been uh, students' access at home. And so uh, while we are not a residential provider, we work with many residential providers. And so we have joined uh, uh, various projects that school districts are leading to get from the school district uh, to their students' homes, particularly students who are in uh, low income situations and who do not have uh, access to broadband uh, uh, at home. And so we, uh, I call this our sort of Baskin and Robbins approach. We're trying to understand a variety of uh, different technologies that uh, our private sectors, uh, our private sector partners are using to better understand uh, the technology, uh, the economics, and even the social dimensions of deploying those technologies. Next slide, please. Um, we have been working with partners to, on municipal projects for high poverty communities um, with the University of San Diego and the San Diego uh, Promise Zone. We're looking at uh, building out a wireless mesh uh, in the pri uh, 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 Promise Zone, and uh, that traffic would then uh, go to UC San Diego, and then we would handle the traffic from there. A really interesting project is in the city of San Rafael. It's a project that's led by uh, the uh, Marin uh, Library, County Library, the City of San Rafael, um, and also uh, a private carrier where we're working to deploy uh, a, in 10 city block, a Wi-Fi mesh uh, in arguably the most economically distressed area uh, in San Rafael, uh, the Canal Zone. And then um, with our Pacific Wave peering um, fabric, we have the ability to assist municipalities uh, who are interested in uh, uh, connecting to us in, in, in backhaul and peering services. Um, to date, we have no takers on, the, on that project, but, but there has been significant interest expressed. Next slide, please. Um, We've had um, some successes uh, in connecting um, uh, uh, Native American communities to uh, scenic. Uh, the first major project was connecting 20 tribes in Southern California uh, through the Tribal Digital Village, um, which is run by the Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association, um, uh, to scenic and then to Pacific Wave. Um, handling their traffic, but also um, allowing the uh, tribes uh, the ability to make their own choices about what other networks they want to peer with. And currently we're working with three other tribes. Um, the projects have been slowed significantly uh, by the pandemic, um, but we hope that um, we'll once again be able to pick up momentum uh, on those projects. Tribes have schools, they have libraries, they have scientific organizations, they have healthcare organizations, many of sort of the nat natural clientele uh, of scenic. And so this has been um, a great opportunity to serve um, parts of the state and communities that have not been well served uh, by uh, traditional broadband providers. Next slide, please. Um, we're looking at various augmentations of our backbone. Uh, many of you are aware of the Digital 299 project um, that is now uh, has a, a, a different company uh, associated with it. 
we're in conversation with Humboldt State, uh, some of the tribes along the way, and, and uh, uh, the folks who are both building the terrestrial pathway, but also, uh, as of yesterday, and announced uh, two projects, one Project ECHO, um, uh, that will connect um, from Arcata uh, to Singapore. It will be the longest uh, uninterrupted uh, submarine cable in the world. And it'll have branching units uh, initially to uh, Indonesia and to Guam. Um, you'll note again that we do have a point of presence in Guam. It's a significant point of presence for our research communities. And then there's a second cable that was announced. The lead uh, on those cables are Google and Facebook. Next slide, please. This is just a, an illustration that we did for our colleagues uh, at Humboldt State. One of, the, uh, one of the dimensions that we hope when this project is completed uh, is uh, for us to work with Humboldt State on creating uh, a rural internet exchange. Uh, early in the presentation, you saw that we have uh, 50, uh, uh, I think it would, they were referred to as data centers, they're modest data centers, but data centers nonetheless. And the advantage here is that we can bring uh, caches of heavily used resources, you know, whether it's Akamai or Netflix uh, or educational research resources. Um, and we can also assist in keeping local traffic local. So that doesn't have to be backhauled to major internet nodes in the Bay Area um, or elsewhere. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, if the Humboldt State uh, Exchange uh, is successful, um, it will become another major node on the global uh, r &E network uh, map. Next slide, please. Another area that we have been looking at um, uh, intently is the Coachella Valley uh, south uh, along the Salton Sea and into Imperial County. Um, these are areas that um, have little or no uh, terrestrial infrastructure. Uh, we were involved with the Berger Foundation uh, in building infrastructure in the northern part of the Coachella Valley. We'd like to see if we could um, uh, work with the community and potentially with some of the resources that, that may be imminent um, uh, to build this, this, this capacity out. Ideally, uh, going uh, uh, east and then north again to Needles, where we'd meet uh, another new build, which is being done by a company called Arcadian Infracom. And they have a focus um, on uh, Indian country as well as building new routes. And uh, we would hope to uh, meet them, uh, uh, you know, either in Needles or ideally they would build a lateral um, from Needles to Blythe in India. In in India. Next slide, please. That's just a picture of our existing infrastructure in the Coachella Valley. Next slide, please. Um, we, have, uh, we have seven very large university medical centers that are part of our network, the UC, Stanford, and USC. Um, and just as we have a peering platform for research and a peering platform for education, we have been looking at developing a peering platform for healthcare uh, in California so that uh, healthcare institutions could take um, a very robust connectivity to us and use that connectivity in multiple ways and very secure ways. Um, uh, early on, you heard about our project with Epic Systems. Um, we have some great projects underway with Montage Health and the community hospitals in Monterey Peninsula. And um, with uh, currently UC Davis, we're working on something called the Telehealth Partner Network, which would allow UC Davis to connect to their over 200 uh, partner um, hospitals and clinics um, and to conduct uh, a sort of doctor to doctor telehealth. We often hear about telehealth in terms of uh, a physician to a patient at home. But um, uh, these, these uh, medical facility to medical facility ones uh, connections are absolutely critical. And let me give you uh, a, an example that, that uh, actually uh, comes, comes from home. 
Um, uh, there are uh, uh, about 50 specialties that could benefit by this kind of connectivity. You find these specialties often at university medical centers or large urban uh, hospitals, we have these specialties, but they don't necessarily exist out in every community. An example of this is uh, neonatal cardiology. So imagine, if you will, being able to um, uh, go to uh, a local um, rural smaller hospital um, that has a, a, a uh, very robust connection to our network, which is also a low latency network. Um, and uh, to be able to conduct a sonogram uh, at the local hospital and work with the expert, uh, the neonatal cardiologist, who uh, is in one of these specialized facilities, in this case at uh, UC Davis, um, you would need um, uh, incredibly high resolution images. You would need a low latency network because you don't, you don't, you, you're going to be doing this uh, in real time. And it means then you would have access uh, in some of these rural communities to a whole range of specialties uh, that um, these uh, extraordinary um, uh, healthcare facilities uh, offer. Next slide, please. Um, the, finally, the last thing that we have been doing is working with some of you. Uh, and others um, on um, uh, looking at, at uh, particularly at uh, emerging technologies or particular approaches that might be beneficial to un and underserved uh, communities uh, to enable um, uh, uh, the best possible public policy and the uh, best use of uh, public funds to support greater broadband uh, access uh, in California. And we've been working with um, uh, uh, folks around the country who are similarly focused on um, broadband equity, uh, affordability and access. Thank you for attending today. We will make the materials and slides available for you um, post this webinar. And my email is on the screen in case you have any specific follow-up questions that you'd like to send me um, that you may think about later on. I wanna appreciate your time with us today and, and thank you all for being here.